Hey, welcome, guys. Um, I'm just going to open this up with a prayer, and then we're going to worship together. So, Lord, we just uh, give you this time. We thank you for meeting us here, Lord, and we just ask that you would just use this time just to glorify yourself, Lord, and you just be with us while we're worshiping you. In your name we pray. Amen.
spoken word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your So, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety nine. I couldn't earn. Don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending, reckless love of God was your foe, still your love far from me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no word, you paid it all. So, so kind to me Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending Reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down Fights till I'm found Leaves the ninety-nine And I couldn't earn don't deserve it Still you give yourself away And oh, the overwhelming Never-ending, reckless love of God Shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb up Coming up to me Snow wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming up to me There's no shadow No wall you 
fez Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the way The same God who's never late Is working all things out Working all things out Yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley heart is heavy for all my days. Yes, I will. Come on, one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all Working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. And yes, I will sing for joy. But my heart is heavy for all my days. Yes. I will for all my days. Yes, I will. And I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names. That nothing could stand against. And I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names that nothing could stand again yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days Yes, I will for all my days. Yes, I will, and I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names. That nothing could stand against, and I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all names that nothing could stand against yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless your name yes I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy for all my days, yes I will, for all my days, yes I will, for all my days, yes I will. Yeah, Lord, we just praise you and we thank you that you are good all the time and you love us so much and you work all things together for good and we just trust in your plan we trust in your sovereignty and we give you control even in these times god we know that you knew exactly where we would be when all this was going on and we just thank you that you are lord over all of it and we just desire to hear from you to be more connected with you and i just pray that you would be with us as we open your word. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Glad you joined us for our Wednesday night Bible study. Not sure if you're watching this on Wednesday or not, but we're recording it for Wednesday night. 
Before I dive into our study in the Psalms, and as you might have guessed by now if you've been tuning in, I've been using my psalmatic progression that I use for my own personal devotions as some of the seed thoughts for our Wednesday night studies. Uh, I start with the day of the month, the third, for instance, today, and I go 33, 63, 93, 113, whatever it is. <laughs> Get to do my math. Um, and so we'll be today in what I was looking at yesterday, Psalm 2. So I encourage you to get your Bible. But before I do that, I wanted to talk to you that are listening about what our plans are for the future. We're still making some plans to meet in two or three weeks. We're hoping to gather uh, again out in our courtyard. Uh, some of the things we're looking at, we've got some projects we're trying to finish up at the church to get us ready to meet in, a, in an efficient way and get the property ready for that. But there's also the issue of uh, whether the virus spikes in Jackson County, we understand that we're get moving into phase two, which gives us a little more leeway, a little more freedom. But we'll let you know. It looks like probably right now, tentatively, uh, we're looking at the last Sunday in June probably is our start date. We might be able to bump that up a little bit of uh, one more week, um, but we'll let you know as soon as we can get it out. In the meantime, I encourage you to gather with some folks, call some people, some friends, maybe some neighbors, have them to come together for a watch party at your house or at their home and, and uh, have some food, do some fellowship, watch the service together. We're hearing some great reports uh, how God is already beginning to rebuild those connections and use it as a time to, to reach out to people that are kind of marginalized or, or don't have the connections that they need to stay healthy emotionally or in great opportunity to minister spiritually. So we're going to study tonight out of Psalm 2. Let's pause for a word of prayer and ask God to open our hearts as we study together. Lord, I do ask for all of us, uh, both teacher and student, that you would minister to us, Lord. We believe that your Holy Spirit is the only hope we have of both understanding, applying, and living out these truths. We know that you want to renew our minds and transform us through that process. So would you take the belief systems that we have that are not of you, and would you reveal those, Lord, that we might um, not struggle over them, but confess them, allow you to change them, to kind of reprogram the way we think, which leads to a different way we behave. So as we open your word tonight uh, to this psalm, may it stir, may it stimulate, may it be a great evaluation tool for each of us to use in our own lives as we seek to walk with you more closely, to live in a way that makes sense biblically in these crazy days. Lord, these are tough times that we're living in, and we need your help. So open our hearts, open your word, and give us your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm sure you've been watching the news. Our nation's in an uproar. What's happening is really just the tip of the garment, the tip of the iceberg, I should say, as to what's really going on in the hearts and lives of people. Whenever something like this happens, it's usually like a cataclysmic event that polarizes and instantly brings out the frustrations that have been brewing for a long time. And so our prayers are for everybody in our country to find peace. We know that uh, violence begets violence, and so we're praying for the whole situation. We might do, end up doing a podcast about justice, be watching for that. But in the meantime, yesterday as I was doing my devotions, I, I came, ran across this, and it says, Psalm 2, Why do the nations rage? And the people plot vain thing or do vain things that have no real point. Uh, vanity, if you remember from the Ecclesiastes, is kind of like the idea of a soap bubble. Uh, it doesn't have any real eternal benefit. But we do them and we get involved in them. And so as I was reading this, I began to just kind of personalize it and, and use the story that was happening then. Psalm 2 has some prophetic uh, pictures of the messianic rule of Jesus in it, but it also has a great opportunity for us to kind of ask ourselves uh, some questions, to use it as a litmus test, sort of a prioritizing of what's really going on in here, because it's what's happened in here that ends up affecting the way I react to other people's reactions, and that's what's going on in our country today. So let's read the whole psalm. It's got 12 verses, and we'll come back and, and break it down. Why do the nations rage? And the people plot 
a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let's break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. And he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision, and then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Speaking of that messianic rule of Jesus at some point. Verse 10, now therefore be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Very clearly messianic in tone. Um, and even in the New Testament, uh, Jesus used this to talk about the, the, the reality of him being David's son. Um, and the book of Hebrews quotes this quite, quite uh, frequently also in establishing who Jesus is and his identity as the true son of God. And we, we want to talk about those, but I wanted to personalize this as we go through it. In the first couple of verses we see clearly the rebellion of mankind. It's in the heart of man from the very first sin in the garden. The sin of Adam and Eve wasn't so much that they, they snuck around, they, they really made a deliberate decision, Adam especially, to say, I want what I want, not what you want. I choose what I choose, and I want to run my own life. In essence, they were saying to God, we can do this without you. We, we don't need you. And that's what's in the heart of human beings and it's caused all kinds of problems in families and in countries and we're seeing it even today that the attitude of men in, in rebellion against authority and rebellion against each other uh, brings about this, this rage that walls and beats against one another. And so the question that you want to ask is, am I rebelling? Am I kicking against something that, that God has established in my life to bring order? to bring purpose and direction perhaps? And how am I reacting to those things in my life? Do I chafe against those that are designed to be guardrails to keep me on the straight and narrow? How do I act about authority in my life? Do I have an authority issue? Do I have an authority problem? Am I looking for opportunities to buck against the, the things that are kind of constricting me or I feel constricted? And the reason that I think it's important for us to ask those kind of questions is I can see rebellion in others. I can watch pride at work in other people. But often I miss it in myself. You know, it's like the little boy that was told to sit down. And he said, I don't want to sit down. They made him sit down. And he goes, well, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. What's going on in the inside is what I believe the Lord wants us to kind of check and we can't do that without stopping and doing a little bit of, of, of introspection, not morbidly, not looking for problems, but just being honest with ourselves. Am I rebelling? Do I have a spirit of rebellion about me? Um, and he goes on to say that he who sits in the heavens shall laugh and the Lord shall hold them in derision. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his pleasure. I've set my king upon my holy Hill of Zion. So God responds to the rebellion of men with this attitude of saying, wait, wait, don't forget who's really in charge here. Uh, God is sovereign. God is in control. God sits above the circle of the earth, we're told. In fact, one of my favorite images is when the Bible says that the heavens is, are his throne and the earth is his footstool. It gives the idea of God sits suspended above this whole thing. And while the nations may rage against each other and may, while races may pit one another and we may have all kinds of political polarization going on in our country, God sits above it all and asks the questions and says, do you really think that your rebellion is going to get you anywhere? Well, because that's God's response, I want to ask myself, is God rebuking me in some way? Is, is God challenging the way I'm acting in a way that would cause me to say, wait, 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 
What is God looking for? God says he searches the hearts. It's not that God searches the hearts so he can find out what's going on in them. He searches the hearts so that we can learn what's going on in them. Now, maybe you're the kind of person that knows what you want when you want it or what you're feeling when you feel it. But some of us, growing up in the family that we did, I'm not always aware or in tune with how I'm feeling until a little bit later, after the fact. And so what I did in my devotions the other day is I took my journal and I read this. And I, is God rebuking me? God, is there something going on in my circumstances that are designed by you to stop me short and make me think? I was reading just a few days before that out of the book of Ecclesiastes where in chapter 7 the writer of the Ecclesiastes said, when you're going through times of plenty, then be joyful. But when you're going through seasons of affliction, think, stop and think, consider. And God has done this for a reason. And so I believe that what's happening in, in America, what's happening in, in our country with the COVID and now with the riots going on all across is, is a time for us not to necessarily look what everybody else is doing, but if we're honest and if we want to grow and mature and grow up, and we, we would need to ask these questions. Is God rebuking me? Is God listening to my behavior and to my attitude and saying, listen, do you really have that? Do you really want to do that? Is that something you really want to do? Because remember, when the Holy Spirit moved into our lives, one of His chief purposes in my life is to convict of sin but also to bring me to the point of seeing Jesus as central and so God shows me by my attitudes and actions uh, what's going on that makes Jesus be marginalized put to the side not necessarily in charge um, he's like I like to say sometimes it helps me remember these things while the Holy Spirit may be resident he's not always president in charge and so the situations that happen in our life whether that's interpersonal relationships maybe you're fighting with your wife all the time maybe you're continually having uh, money problems and we know that you don't solve money problems with money so what's what's really going on God uses those situations at, like he does in this text to kind of challenge the attitude of, of his people he goes on to say in verse 7 I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you, speaking of the Son of God. Uh, Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the nations ends of the earth for your possession, and you shall break them with a rod of iron, speaking of the rule of Jesus, and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Speaking of the time, and I mentioned this last Sunday, when Jesus establishes his messianic rule on the earth, he will rule righteously, he'll rule graciously, but he will rule nonetheless. And there will be this, he is the final authority. Um, so the rule of the sun makes me ask this question, even though that's a future reality, is Jesus reigning in my heart right now? Does he really have the right, have I given him the right to call the shots, to set the priorities to direct my steps is there something in my life that I've said Lord I'm going to do this part you can have Sundays I'll give you Sundays um, but I get to run the rest of my life or I'll give you 10 percent but I get to run the, the rest of the 90 percent or whatever it is that that's going on the question is designed to make me look at my own priorities is Jesus really in charge how do I know that I only know that if my behavior lines up with my belief system. If what I say I believe doesn't show up in my behavior, then I'm just kidding myself. And boy, are we good at that. We, humans can justify any kind of behavior if we want. It's, if, in fact, I have a friend who says this, if you can justify anything, you can justify anything. <laughs> it's just a way of saying, and I've seen it lived out in my own life, is that if I want something bad enough, and I'm going to find excuses and reasons and justifications to make it happen. So what the question comes back then, what is the benefit of real surrender to Jesus? It not only brings a life of purpose and focus, but it takes the pressure off. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, 
to seek first, first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things. Well, what other things? Things like, do I have enough money to buy clothing or do what about shelter or food? Those basic realities and necessities of life can, can take my focus, bring about anxiety, produce worry, and get me so horizontal in my thinking that all of a sudden I'm running my own life and reacting to the things in my life. So one of the benefits, I think, as a, as a child of God is just saying, Lord, I really want to just throw my hands up and say, Jesus, it's all yours. You do, and you direct, and I will do what you say. That spirit of obedience, by the way, obedience is its own reward. I don't obey so that God will give me or do for me or take care of me. Uh, when I obey, and I know it's the right thing, when I know in my knower that it's the right thing to do, to understand his concepts and his precepts, to let them guide my decision processes, to put priorities where they belong, man, things begin to work. Life begins to work, and it brings about a, a, a causality where this decision leads to the next decision and to the next decision. That happens negatively, too. But, man, what a delight to put things in their proper order. Put Jesus where he belongs. Is Jesus reigning in your heart? Who's really in charge of your life? Sad to say, it's been my experience as I've been in ministry now for, gosh, 35 years or so, that a lot of people who claim to be God's kids live as if there is no God. Uh, there's a phrase for it. Theologians, theologians call it that practical atheism where they give lip service that there's a God. We give lip service that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, but we make every decision without consulting him, without regarding his, his will in our lives, and we wonder why the consequences happen the way they do. So the question needs to be asked, and I think it needs to be asked by every Christian, whether he's a leader of a church, or whether he's a leader of a home, or whether you're brand new in your faith. Is Jesus really in charge? Is he on the throne of my heart? I remember you see, seeing a little diagram where it showed a circle with a throne, had a cross sitting on the throne, and self kneeling in front. So a little S, Jesus the cross sitting on the throne. And everything in the circle was in order. Then the next little diagram showed a circle with S, little S, on the throne. Jesus, the cross, set to the side. And everything is chaotic inside it's just a diagram that i've never forgotten but i've watched it lived out in my life when those seasons happen when i say god i got this lord i can handle this or i just by just my actions prove that i've moved on without consulting him man then then certainly self is on the throne jesus is marginalized and things go like they go i get what i thought I deserved and sometimes you get what you want and then you don't want what you got you ever experienced that that happened with the children of Israel multiple times and it's happened with me too but when Jesus is on the throne when you genuinely say Lord I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender all man life begins then to take on a whole different purpose whole different focus and and as a consequence then things began to flow not always easy don't misunderstand but always purposeful and always to the point where you can say one thing i know is that i'm doing what he asked me to do so let's read on the psalmist goes on to say now therefore be wise o kings be instructed you judges of the earth and serve the lord with fear and rejoice with trembling Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed, blessed or happy, joyful, in that sense of shalom where God's peace permeates. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So as God has declared the rebellion of man met by the rebuke of the Lord, reminding them to, to put the rule of the son as primary, now he's encouraging them to say this is, how it, this is how it plays out. So the question I want to ask is, 
Am I responding to God's advice? When the Lord says, hey, um, take some instruction. Learn to be corrected. If, if we are correctable, if we are teachable, man, there's nothing God can't do in our lives. There's nothing God can't overcome in our life. No amount of dysfunction from your childhood is enough to keep you from experiencing God's best if you, in fact, and I, I want to put myself in there because, man, have I walked this myself, is if I'm listening and responding, then as God instructs me and challenges me and rearranges the way I think, the things that I believe to be true all of a sudden are now brought in clearer focus and I can see where my mixture of truth and lies has led me to some misconceptions and misunderstandings. Whereas God's truth is liberating, where God's truth is freeing. When, when Jesus said, you shall know the truth, he used the word epigonosko in the Greek, which means to know intimately, know by experience. When you know in your know or deep the truth, absolute truth, God's truth, then God says the truth shall make you free. Not set you free like you've been chained up, but make you free as in literally turn you into a free, loving individual that is now free to be who God designed you to be. There's so many limitations that our selfishness, that our rebellion, that our self-seeking and self-protection protection that we put around ourselves, all those things have limiting effects to our maturity, to our relational depths that we can have with other people, to the ability to have meaningful uh, relationship with God. And so when His truth comes and I embrace his truth and let his truth filter through my life, then all of a sudden I find myself experiencing greater and greater freedom. So when he says, hey, be instructed, kings. Listen, you wise, to the Lord's instruction. And then he gives them some specifics. Learn to serve God with fear. And it doesn't mean phobia, like I'm so afraid of God. I think we have a right to be afraid of God. He certainly is able uh, as sovereign God to do what he wants to do. But I really believe that that is a, a reference to it, more of a reverence, um, letting God be big, me be small. It's the precursor to genuine humility where I understand who he is so I can truly understand who I am Unless I see God as he is, I have a misconstrued idea of who I am. I remember one of my favorite sermons, uh, listening to the founder of this church, Andy Green, he loved to talk about Isaiah 6. And if you remember in Isaiah 6, uh, God shows up. In the year King Uzziah died, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, and he was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple, and the doors of the post moved at the voice of the angels crying, holy, holy, holy. If you remember that context, the next thing that happened was Isaiah said, when I saw the Lord, then I saw myself, and I said, woe is me, I am undone. When you truly began to see God for who he is, then you can take your rightful place as a creature underneath your creator. Humility, remember, is not thinking less of yourself. It really is thinking of yourself less. And there is incredible freedom that comes when you just forget about yourself, when you don't have to be the one to speak in every conversation. You don't have to dispense your opinion about every single matter that happens. It's wonderful to be set free, to just be, to just be you, and to be in that situation. Knowing who God is leads you to know who you are. And he goes on to say, rejoice with trembling, and that's kind of seemed almost like an oxymoron to be happy about, about trembling, but I think it has the idea and reminds it, reminded me in my devotions the other day of the scripture in Philippians that says, to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Remember that one? Uh, but take it very seriously how you're working out what God is working in. But the verse goes on to say in Philippians that for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's where I jump. My mind jumped to that one when I read this. To rejoice with trembling has the idea of being glad about being serious, <laughs> being intentional 
about walking in obedience. Brings me full circle back to where we started in this. And then he ends this passage with this kind of overarching reminder that there's personal value that comes. There's a payoff. There really is in knowing that I've done everything I can do to respond to God's challenges, to God's rearranging of my circumstances that have brought me up short, perhaps, and saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I will do it. I, I give in. I give up. I release my expectations of others. I, I'm going to stop trying to control others because, man, that will make you crazy and make them crazy too. You, you heard the definition, right, of a perfectionist, the one who takes great pains and gives them to everyone else. Man, when we try to make others behave and not do certain things, man, it make us crazy and them too. And I think this brings us to the point where we can say, when I let the Lord be the Lord in my life, then whatever happens, good or bad, hard or easy, I can know this, that it's all right. When everything's all right with me and God, then it's going to be all right no matter what. He will take me through. He will take me on. He will teach me what I need to learn in that situation. Met with the staff uh, earlier today. We brought up uh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, one of the first verses that I ever remembered. And it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct your paths. And the psalmist here in Psalm 2 even though it was direct and it was addressed to nations and kings that were bringing rebellion and causing chaos, he ends by saying that those who choose to put their trust in the Lord find their lives blessed. Are you responding to God's challenges in your life? Are the things that are happening in our country producing fear and insecurity and maybe frustration in you, what a great opportunity for you to do just a little soul searching and let the Spirit of God point out the things that He wants to point out. Things that are maybe a little too important, things that have gotten a little out of whack. And by simple admission, you don't have to fix yourself. You, you just got to be honest with yourself. And then when we confess that to the Lord and we say, Oh God, you've shown me this and that attitude and it needs to go. All of a sudden, when I confess out what's wrong, the next breath I breathe in what God wants to do in my life. And it's God's way through this wonderful gift of repentance. Repentance is not a bad word. Christians use it and people have seen it as a repent. But I don't think that's the real tenor of it. The, the New Testament word metanoia just means to change your mind, to kind of turn around, which leads to a new way of thinking and automatically leads to a new way of living. So if God has spoken to you in some way, and I know He is in my heart, in my life, showing things that maybe I can't figure out why this is not working, and God reveals my attitude toward it. And I always like to say it's my reaction to their reaction that causes a reaction. And that's what tends to happen. And and if I'm honest, my little part to play in that is to own my own feelings and my own attitudes and when I do that then God sets things free my heart becomes lighter my head becomes clearer my purpose becomes more in focus and then I can get back to doing the things and enjoying the life that is directed by God the psalmist wanted his people and I want you and I want me to experience God's best And remember, God's best is always on the other side of obedience. Trust in the Lord. Put your trust in Him. Let Him be your number one. And when that happens, God begins to make things work in a better way. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Bible study. Let's pray this in, could we? Lord, I just confess, it's so good to remind myself by trying to remind others how important it is to put you at the center, to put you on the throne, to look for those times when self has taken charge and I'm going to put things the way I want them and it never works out, Lord, it really never does. But when you're on the throne, when I'm listening, when I'm saying, yes, Lord, I hear and I'll obey, 
things began to make sense. That's the way you designed us, God. You designed us to have you at the center, putting in us what you want from us, directing our steps because we trust in you. Would you bless that individual that is being honest with themselves and saying, oh man, I've, God is challenging me and, and I have been rebuked and I need to surrender and I ask that you give us all the grace to say, yes, Lord, you can have it. Have my life, have my future, have my family, have my business, um, have everything about me, Lord, and then put in me what you want from me. Bless your people. Set us free. God, these are difficult days. Help us to live stable, God-honoring lives for your glory and for our joy. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you.
Jesus, bring new wine out of me. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled. And die for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. He laid him down. Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still in all alone. Oh, praise the Yeah. 